did you know that clinical event debriefing can actually improve quality indicators? Do you care about quality indicators and patient safety? Because event clinical event debriefing can drastically improve that. So there is a lot of literature out there to support that. Welcome to Safe Space Made Simple, a practical podcast that guides clinical leaders and healthcare managers to create trust and support with their teams. I'm your host, Trace Hobson. Join me for weekly interviews, practical tools, and inspiring transformational stories of bringing people together in healthcare. Now, let's dive in. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Safe Space Made Simple. My name is Trace Hobson. I'm your host. And this podcast was designed for clinical nurse leaders, healthcare managers, and executives to learn how to generate a safe space. And we have a very special show today that's going to help you to do just that. I have Jamie Gallagher, who's on the show today, a simulation educator and passionate lifelong emergency nurse. Jamie and I have a vibrant conversation about clinical debriefing and all things related to psychological health and safety and how to generate that in a high performance team in healthcare. Jamie's work is so inspiring and I loved having this conversation with her and I know you're going to enjoy it as well. So without further ado, let's get right into the show. Jamie Gallagher, welcome to our show. I'm really excited to have a conversation with you. And so just to begin with, it would be great if you could share with the audience a little bit about who you are, the kind of work you do, and um, some something that you're really passionate about in your work. Sure. Thanks, Trace. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I'm definitely a huge fan. Um, and I've been listening to this podcast a lot lately. So thank you. It's such a privilege. Yeah, so I'm Jamie Gallagher. I am... Uh, a simulationist and an emergency nurse. So I currently work for Thompson Rivers University. Um, I'm kind of their faculty educator, instructional support for all things simulation here at the School of Nursing with uh, BSN students and nurse practitioners. So we just kind of help promote um, and design high quality simulation. We have a brand new sim center with all the state of the art equipment and whatnot. So we do that. I do that. I also still work clinically as an eMERGE nurse. I've been an eMERGE nurse for about 16 years, and I've been an educator both at, you know, level one trauma centers in Vancouver um, and regional educators and worked rural and remote. So kind of have the breadth of all things emergency nursing, and I'm still incredibly passionate about it. So I still try and pick up clinically there. Um, and then I also work, I'm faculty with the Debriefing Academy, which is a global organization for healthcare simulation debriefing with um some of the most brilliant minds in simulation debriefing. So I do that um, through a virtual platform every few months. So I work with their team. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's what I do. I love debriefing. <laughs> you love debriefing. So <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I get the benefit of being able to ask somewhat dumb questions because no. I'm not, I don't have a clinical background. I and so it. when you say I'm, I'm all things debriefing, I have a passion for debriefing. Yeah. Why is debriefing so important and mm -hmm. why do you have a passion for it? Yeah. I love that. So yeah, debriefing, I think because when I started out as an educator, so I've been a nurse since 2007, when I started out in education in 2009, I think I struggled with how to really ask questions. I used to use a lot of like, guess what I'm thinking questions, and I didn't really know how to educate properly. And then I stumbled upon the art of debriefing. And really what I classify as debriefing is just a relaxed like reflective learning conversation. So there's lots mm -hmm. of different definitions for it, but in short, it's just a conversation either between two people or in a group where you kind of reflect on either a task or your day or, the, you know, a resuscitation or, you know, a group event. And you kind of pull back the layers and kind of have people reflect together on what did we do well? Where are some areas for improvement? How is everybody doing? And my earliest kind of exposures to this kind of formalized debriefing process is probably what catapulted my obsession with it back in 2016, where I was working at uh, Vancouver General Emergency. And I was the clinician at the time, but we had a really messy case um, where it was like an airway case and lots of trauma. And anyways, it was a really tense event. And I remember kind of thinking, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been teaching in this area, but I still didn't feel like I did great in it. And there was a lot of different elements and competing priorities. And anyways, the patient didn't make it. But what happened is that one of the trauma 
neurosurgeons that I was working with at the time. Um, he was a bit of like a scary individual to work with. He was ex-military, but he kind of huddled us together and said, let's just have a chat. And I was like, okay. So we kind of gathered our team and we kind of talked about, you know, some things that went well and, you know, some things that were challenges. And he did a bit of in the moment teaching. And then he actually just took the time to say, you guys all did excellent in what you did. I don't, nothing we would have done could have changed the outcome. And for some reason in that moment, I just like really needed to hear that because I think I was beating myself up about like being slow to get the IV or fumbling with the blood transfusion. And I just feel like that set something in me that I was like, I needed to hear this. And if this had such a profound impact on me, like imagine people who are newer in this area and how important that would be to hear that. And so we started trying to do a bit more of these regular debriefings. And then I became obsessed with it because I started seeing the impact that it had on our on our team's stress, on our team cohesion, on our team teaching and our learning. And so ever since then, I've tried to be implemented at every institution <laughs> I'm at. So <laughs> that's kind of what has, um, yeah, what started my obsession and why I think it's so important for healthcare teams. And now the literature is just so profoundly in favor of it, right. which I'm really so happy to see um, that it really is, you know, best practice standard just as like you know a sepsis protocol or a chest pain protocol like clinical event mm. debriefing to create high performing teams and create decreased stress within healthcare um the literature stands by it and so it just really needs to be implemented but there's still some hesitation around that so i think that's what drives me to kind of continue trying to educate and advocate for this process yeah i appreciate what you're sharing i think that there's a there's a crossover for me because the work that i do with clinical leaders managers and executives we often talk about the quality of self regulation and co regulation and what happens when we're witnessed and when we take the time to support another person with our presence mm -hmm. there's something so powerful right when we do that and i love mm -hmm. your story because it really taps on that that may be something that you didn't even know you needed until it actually it happened, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's like you open the relief valve at that point, and mm -hmm. man, you're not taking that home, right? Yes, that's, exactly. That's, the, that's so in incredibly important. Yeah. yeah. So that makes me wonder about why the hesitation. Why are mm -hmm. there? Why do you? What kind of hesitations are you seeing in this in the healthcare system that mm -hmm. would say we don't want this? Mm -hmm. Sure, I think there's some previous thoughts around, so there's different types of debriefing. And in the clinical psychology literature, debriefing is really around managing and preventing like acute stress disorders and PTSD. And so that's more of a debrief to kind of manage or debrief to treat. Mm -hmm. um, that's not our goal with clinical event debriefing. Our goal with um, clinical event debriefing is debriefing to learn. So we really want to learn from each other, you know, if there was any um, issues with equipment or systems or processes or team dynamics, communication, any sort of that medication issues that have come up. We really want to debrief to learn. So I think there's a bit of hesitation because maybe the people aren't understanding the concept and the goal of the debriefing. Right. And if you start to think about practitioners thinking, oh my gosh, this was a heavy emotional case. I don't know if I'm going to be able to debrief that. That's the self-awareness that we need that we are not clinical psychologists and registered, mm -hmm. you know, a psychiatrist. That is not what we're actually intending to do. So if the case is incredibly traumatic or high stress, that's actually probably not the time mm -hmm. and place for us as bedside clinicians to be debriefing. It right. might be a bit of a, a diffusion and like a check-in, like how's everybody doing? And then you have that like nonverbal or verbal um, mm -hmm. appreciation that there's a lot mm -hmm. of distress in the room and it's like, okay, here's the deal. We're going to set up a formal debriefing. I'm going to contact the managers and we are going to set up, you know, a formal debriefing in the days to come once with the actual trained specialist. So I think there's a bit of uh, maybe a misunderstanding as to what the goal is and what the, mm -hmm. you know, what our ulterior motive is, which is around debriefing to learn, to learn in our healthcare systems to make it better. And then there's always a little bit of that intrinsic fear that it's going to turn into a blame and shame session. So a little right. bit of finger pointing, especially if things don't go well. And that's, again, when we talk about creating a psychologically safe space, um, that's really important in these situations that we make sure that it does not turn into that. And I've rarely 
um, had that occur in my experience with this, but there is always that risk involved that it might come into. And I've heard stories where people try to debrief a clinical event that went quite poorly and Mm -hmm. people are emotional and want to point fingers and tell people what they did wrong. And that in itself is incredibly traumatic and nobody would ever want to come to one of those and be humiliated in front of their colleagues. So the way to um, counter that is to really set some ground rules. And most of the mm-hmm. debriefing tools out there really lay that foundation that this is not for personal assessment. This is not for, you know, personal performance. Um, if people want to make suggestions on how we together can communicate better, I think that's great. But if there are, you know, severe concerns about somebody's clinical practice, I always say praise in public, give feedback in private, private, mm-hmm. but that should be a private conversation behind closed doors. And so we really have to lay those ground rules before you start opening up a clinical event debriefing. So those are kind of the two main mm-hmm. issues, I think, in people's perceptions when they think, oh, I don't want to do a debriefing because there, there's a little bit of risk on both of those sides. But I think mm-hmm. if we learn enough about it as facilitators, we can really have these optimal and super safe and highly effective debriefings, which we can all f- leave feeling so much less stressed, feel like we highlighted some great things we did and we've learned from it. And those are so positive. And I would say that's 90, 95% of the debriefings that we do. The other caveat mm. is time. People are always like, we don't have enough time. And I'm like, yes, we do. This five minutes is yeah. instrumental. So that's yeah. another barrier and, that we kind of struggle with. Yeah. Well, and we're going to talk about that from a leadership uh, and management perspective too, because yeah. I think that might be one of the hesitancies that I notice is the operational schedule doesn't have quote end quote room for yeah. that. And and I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And, yeah. and I also want to thank you for bringing in the CISM practice or critical incident mm-hmm. stress management practice, because mm-hmm. that is a different That's scope different. of work. Yeah, definitely. And, but, but to your point though, if you're not doing any kind of a debrief, you're not going to get to that referral. Exactly. So exactly. you got to You got to do the initial it's debrief kind of clinically. Check. Exactly. Pulse check. I love that. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Is a pulse check. So, and then you can identify those those sim- that symptomology. Is it, what's going on in the group, so exactly. that you can then you know support escalate that, that process. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. It makes all kinds of sense. So, you brought in psychological health and safety, and I'm curious. Um, one of the questions that I ask, you know, brilliant coaches or managers, leaders, nurse leaders, and I'm going to ask you as well, when you're generating a safe space, what are you doing internally mm-hmm. to generate that space and encourage and invite others into the same kind of practice? Yeah, I love that question. So a lot of this comes from the simulation literature. So we talk a lot about psychological safety in SIM. And so there's a couple different things. Around there was a you know a groundbreaking paper by Jenny Rudolph like 2006 or something. And it was all talking about judgment and there's no such thing as like non-judgmental debriefing. And so we we know that we all go into situations like this with a little bit of judgment, but how we need to frame it as facilitators is to have good judgment and so always come from a lens of curiosity. And I think for someone to create a safe space, that's just how we have to enter all of these reflective learning conversations is just to have a lens of curiosity. We kind of joke in Sim that we kind of use the frame, you know, understanding, um, we might think in our head like WTF, like why did they just do that? I'm curious. But changing that from WTF in the organic meaning to what's their frame, like really yeah. trying to uncover like what... I am curious why they did that because we might think in our head, oh my gosh, they just screwed up. That was that is not how we do that protocol or that's not the policy or that's not how that equipment is meant to be set up. But instead of just like you need to create that safe space, that psychological safety and, and just be respectful and have um, asked the question and be curious. So, hey, you know, so and so I'm curious as to, you know, you decided to set this machine up or start this medication before that. Can you tell me why you did that? And just like be very genuinely curious. Mm. Um, so we talk a lot about, you know, unpacking frames because maybe their answer is, oh, that's because so and so just told me to do it this way. And you're like, oh, OK, interesting. We need to explore that because that's just not what I learned. Or right. it could be like, I didn't know any better. And then you can do a bit of in the moment teaching like, yeah, that's great. Okay. So normally we would start this infusion before this one. And this is why. And so you have lots of, um, you know, you really try to just model that the vulnerability and you really want to normalize that it's okay to not know, but so you really need to intuitively and organically be curious. And then the other thing that we talk about is just how much body language comes into it. So really being mindful of your facial expressions, your tone, smiling, 
sitting versus standing, trying to flatten a bit of that hierarchy, all those sorts of things that people might not think about. So mm -hmm. a lot of creating psychologically safe spaces is just um, is a lot of nonverbal. So, you know, it's interesting to watch newer facilitators and, you know, they might be a bit closed off or if you see somebody really looking down at the ground, trying to ask like, hey, are you doing OK? Or And then being mindful mm -hmm. of your own tone and body language, because, again, we might hold a bit of that judgment, but it's how you ask the question and how you deliver it is really what's going to create a psychologically safe space for people to kind of maybe admit that they didn't know what they were doing or they made a mistake. And and that's a high level scale for facilitators, which is um, why these clinical event debriefings usually come from people with a bit more experience because they think we are a bit more mindful of how we come across and how to create psychological safety, especially if you have some background in simulation debriefing. Mm. I hope that answered your question. You are, you are <laughs> filling my heart with joy okay. oh, listening good. to the way you're sharing this because Thanks. so, so first of all, you, you've really broken it down and we're going to double click on this a little bit because yeah. I love the way that you're sharing it. Um, and, and the way that I describe this is there's, there's top down safety, which is psychological mm -hmm. health and safety, but then there's also bottom up safety, which is, mm. uh, neurobiological safety or, uh, polyvagal safety, Dr. Stephen oh, Porges' yeah. work. And yeah. when you, when you notice judgment that's happening inside of mm -hmm. you. So first of all, I, whenever I work with groups or, or do workshops, you know, show of hands, who doesn't have judgment mm -hmm. of different things? I mean, everybody has judgment, right? Yeah. So it's not about, you know, trying to shut that down. Mm -mm. I like the way that you leaned into it and then, you know, the ch changed the WTF to what's their frame. Yeah. What's you know, their frame? Yeah. and you could, this, there's this idea, I think that human beings can hold um, more than one perspective that even is contradictory. So there's this sense of judgment, but also curiosity. And so absolutely, yeah. to me, that's about self-regulation. You got to actually slow down yes, and that's take so a true. deep breath and plant yeah. your feet. And absolutely. Yeah. So let's break it down a little bit for people that are listening and wondering, like, how could I do this? Because the other thing that this leads up to is sort of a high level skill that you mentioned is facilitation. And facilitation is an art form. And mm -hmm. I think that every manager, leader, clinical practitioner uh, needs to develop the the art of of facilitation. I like agree. I think, even yeah. if it's just a, a conversation, to be able to yeah. facilitate a space where we can have a conversation, mm -hmm. and you did it beautifully in in this. So let's break it down a little bit. So let's say that you're observing something and and you have that initial sort of um, yeah. activation in your yeah. body. Yeah. I've had that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I, yeah. I, I had it 20 minutes ago with my wife. <laughs> so it's like, so yeah. what what do you do with that? What's the first thing? Like how do you how what's the developed signal you've created for yourself mm. to slow yourself down to the speed of your presence in that moment? Like what are you doing inside? Yeah, I've never been asked that. And I don't actually know if I've self-reflected on that, to be honest. Um we're going to do it just, right now, right? Here. I know. I love this. Yeah, I think I have. And again, we learn from our mistakes. So this is why I love sim is because through mm -hmm. simulation. So I have entered these type of conversations um, emotionally triggered or feeling flustered and and those conversations don't go nearly as well. So I've learned from that from my years as an educator mm. approaching people or scenarios with um emotion into it mm -hmm. and I've noticed myself not being able to articulate our wor my words and not being able to like you know create a safe space for the learner to be able to admit that so I think I've learned just through trial and error in myself of how that works and we really talk yeah. in simulation around how emotion does cloud cognition so if we really mm -hmm. want you know, students and learners or, you know, teams, even high performing teams, a physician of 20 years to really reflect and learn from a certain experience. If there is a high level of emotion attached to it, we're not really going to get to the underpinning of that of that learning. So I think I've just noticed in myself that if I enter a situation and very similar to partners and parenting and all this sort of stuff, if you're entering into a conversation feeling emotional, it's never going to go as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think for myself, I just try to really be like, am I in a good space to approach this right now? Am I feeling right. triggered? Am I feeling jarred? You know, maybe it's, a, you know, a nurse that I've worked with multiple times that we've gone through multiple scenarios and I'm seeing the same kind of like mm -hmm. issues coming up. So I feel angry. I feel disrespected. Like, oh, they didn't listen to me. So mm -hmm. really trying to make it not about me and maybe not about the person, but making it about the situation and right. just kind of slowing my breathing down, understanding and being mindful of whether or not I'm 
in a good space to have this conversation. I do always mm. recommend that for feedback and debriefing, it's done sooner because our perceptions of reality of what occurred really start to get skewed the longer you wait. Mm. So days to weeks, like that memory, core memory is going to, can be very, um, have very different reoccurrences depending on changes. people. So the so yeah, it changes. And so the sooner we can have these conversations, but I tell people at the same time and for myself, if you feel like you're entering into that space, feeling like you're not emotionally well enough to have these conversations, then we need to be mindful and have that kind of emotional intelligence to kind of either take some time or try to have it the next day if you're in a yeah. better place. So I think just yeah. being mindful that despite the fact how much you might want to have this conversation, if you're going to enter it triggered and feeling, um, you know, like there's a high level of emotion that might not be the best time. And I think we need to see that in other people too. I've tried to approach certain debriefs, debriefings or feedback sessions with um, learners and I can see that they're in a high emotional state and I need to be mindful that this may not be the time, which is why I usually right. ask permission. Are you okay if we have a quick conversation right now? Right. And that gives them the opportunity to say, no, I'm, I'm just, I just got yelled at. The family is like calling me now is not a good time. And I'm like, great. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I asked rather than forcing myself in on a, a conversation because that's not, a, too, that's not respectful either. So just being mindful that we all need to kind of be in a space to have these conversations. Yeah. I really appreciate that, that you're doing there to giving the person agency to choose mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not trying to enforce something on somebody, which also is an activator too. So so yeah. it's just going to add fuel to the fire maybe in that moment. Right. So yeah. that's, that's really powerful what you're saying there. Um, Thanks. Yeah. And just to double click again, just to say sure. that like for these clinical event debriefings is very much voluntary. Nothing is mandatory, despite right. the fact if you were the leader in the resuscitation or the nurse leader or, you know, the primary nurse up on the ward, if you're not in a good headspace to attend, this is completely voluntary. So that's the one caveat I just wanted to be really clear with these debriefing yep. conversations is that they're absolutely vol voluntary. There's nothing mandated about them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. do you, in those circumstances when people may not be ready to have that conversation, mm -hmm. do you, do you then delay it or try to do it a little later on, or is it just, maybe it's not going to happen? Yep. Either, or um, if, it's a high level of emotion and maybe this is a debrief to treat kind of um, conversation that needs to happen. Then um, usually the workplace health and safety uh, critical incident stress debriefing does happen right. days to weeks later because people yep. need a period of diffusing and being able to like process, digest, have a good cry and then come a bit, you right. know, in a bit of a better space to, to present. So it might be days or I might just try to come back a few hours later. It would depend on the situation. Yeah. So as you're looking at this and so you're, you're slowing down yourself, you're self-regulating by taking some breaths. Um, you're asking some good questions of yourself, whether or not now's the time for you mm -hmm. is now the time for this person. Mm -hmm. And and then you're you're moving forward if it's time. I, I imagine that as you practice those kinds of things, do you find that you start to grow a capacity to be able to harness the emotion in the moment and be able to work with those activations in the moment as well? Because I know one of the things that I've noticed in, in my developed practice of this for myself is that I definitely have more capacity today than when I started, mm -hmm. you know, many years ago. And so mm -hmm. there's, there's times when, um, the emotion can actually fuel a good conversation too, if it's harnessed mm -hmm. in the right way as mm -hmm. well. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then to your point, there's still times too, when now isn't the right time. Mm -hmm. And so I'll step back as well. So mm -hmm. I'm curious what you've learned about that as well. Yeah. Um, Stuart Rose, who's an eMERGE physician out of Calgary implemented a clinical event debriefing, program back in 2016 with a bunch of emergency departments in Calgary. And they've had, you know, published some great work. And he recently um, put out a study that they did in 2022. And what they identified is that through clinical event debriefing with their teams that they um, 
you know, it really helps them to manage stress. It helps to build more resilient teams and really look at like systems and process issues. But it also helps to diffuse emotion, which I think we need a lot in healthcare these days. There's a high level of emotion, like things are hard, (laughs) times are tough. Like Mm -hmm. there is emotion no matter how long you've been in it. But what really helps and why this clinical event debriefing is so important is that we can all share in that emotion. And so it, it really mitigates that feeling of, isolation and like you're feeling alone in that feeling and we can all kind of just come together and be like I you know maybe you're in your 11th hour you know on a night shift and you know you all have a tough case and everybody admits that they're exhausted and feeling run down and that was highly emotional and that alone in itself is something to be celebrated because that is what is going to keep people coming back to work is the fact that they are in this together and they're not mm-hmm. alone when how they're feeling. And maybe if they go home to their partners and their families who work in like accounting, who's not going to understand them when they talk about these issues mm. to kind of have these little micro conversations afterwards is just so validating and really helps to decrease that stress and decreases attrition. Honestly, um, there have been certain situations that I'm like, maybe I, you know, I have thought, I don't know if I'm cut out for this because of how I was feeling at the time and to feel other people feeling like that and being vulnerable and demonstrating that as a facilitator that we're all vulnerable. It's okay to cry. It's okay to like be angry sometimes, Mm -hmm. depending on the certain situation and that we're in this together and to validate that in a group setting is just so affirming. And I think Mm -hmm. it's something we need a bit more of. So yes, there's emotion and the emotion can be good. Um, and it's all just kind of how we come into those conversations and recognize Absolutely. that and creating that safe space for people to be okay to not be okay. Because in yeah. healthcare right now, and especially through COVID, we were not okay, but we need to be in it together. Do you know what yeah. I mean? I yeah. do. I think that that's actually the the big solution to burnout retention mm-hmm. that you're talking about. Um, there's three components to the mission that I've, I've taken on for myself in my work. And, and the first one is that First of all, first and foremost, that people feel excited about getting out of bed and coming to work. Like, Mm -hmm. what do we need to do to create the kind of environment where people do feel excited to come to work Mm -hmm. in in a healthcare team? And then when they arrive there, that they feel safe with the team that they're Mm -hmm. working with and that that's actually a reality that they have Mm -hmm. day to day. Mm -hmm. And then the third component is that when they go home, they go home feeling energized by the meaningful Mm -hmm. work that they did Mm -hmm. with their colleagues that day because Mm -hmm. every healthcare team I talk to or work with says the same thing like we we go home tired Mm -hmm. but we go home energized because we're shoulder to shoulder with people that we care about and that care about us and we're doing important work yeah so I I feel like that you you captured that that. really well right thanks hey just a quick pause to today's podcast Are you having a challenge as a clinical leader with one or more individuals who you find activate you on your team? Or maybe you're noticing that oftentimes you want to be able to communicate with people, but in the the heat of the moment, it's difficult for you because you're having a difficult time regulating yourself. Well, I totally understand this. This has been some of the biggest challenges in my life as a leader and as a human being. And so I created a free resource for clinical leaders, nurse educators, and healthcare executives called the Relationship Regulator. It's a mini course that will show you step-by-step a framework that may serve you very powerfully in this area. So if you want to download the Relationship Regulator for free, click in the show notes and you'll find that resource for you today. Now back to the show. So let's, I want to play the devil's advocate a little bit with with some of the, the tough managers that I've encountered in healthcare in my work over the last, say, eight or nine years that would say, you know, that's all fine and well, but um, I don't got a lot of time for the woo. I don't have a lot of time for the fluff. You know, I, we're we're a hard clinical practicing yeah. team. We don't have time for emotion. We don't, I don't mm-hmm. even know if we have time for debriefing. So mm-hmm. make your case Mm-hmm. for that manager. And and we will include the reference you mentioned in the sure. show notes. Yeah. I'll get that reference from you because I think that's yeah. a great reference. But yeah. what would you say to a manager or a clinical leader, maybe a patient care coordinator, mm-hmm. or even an executive, a director who's saying, yeah, I don't have time for this. What sure. would you say? I would say, well, did you know that clinical event debriefing can actually improve quality indicators? Do you care about quality indicators and patient safety? Because Event clinical event debriefing can drastically improve that. 
So there is a lot of literature out there to support that we have better cardiac arrest outcomes. There's better neonatal outcomes, labor and delivery terms that do a lot of clinical event debriefing. They have safer, better birth. Um, there's OR teams that debrief regularly and they have, again, better, you know, decreased rates of like sepsis and, you know, post-op infections or they have better teamwork. And then it also really helps with staff morale and staff feeling like they are part of the team. So there is less likelihood to have attrition, um, mm. turnover, that sort of thing. Because when you debrief with a team, you feel a part of the team. And part of that, is, again, is just asking questions. So maybe you leave a certain situation. You're like, why did we do it that way? You know, the last doctor I saw that when we had this case a month ago used a different you know, reversal agent or a different medication. Like, why did we do it this way? And and when you have these moments to like ask these questions, you learn and you actually create way mm. better, more knowledgeable, high-performing teams. And high-performing teams have better patient outcomes. So I would strongly right. argue that this is a really validated method to improve patient safety and improve our quality indicators. So mm. um, you know, sepsis management, STEMI management, trauma care, all these sorts of things, teams that debrief regularly together have way better patient outcome. So I think that yeah. would be important to healthcare leaders. So that would be my answer. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for that. Cause I mean, you're preaching to the choir here a little yeah. bit, but I think, um, you know, if you listen to my show, you know, that we talk a lot about this. Uh, it's, it's the idea of relational equity is also built because mm. you can't navigate complexity like we have in healthcare without relationship as a foundation. Mm -hmm. And what I encourage clinical leaders, managers, and executives, directors to do is to prioritize that as an operational priority mm -hmm. to develop relational equity with your team. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I notice when we do that, when we create spaces where people start to get to know each other in a deeper and different way, is that they do open up that relief valve. There is mm -hmm. a sense of being able to share some of the practice concerns and challenges they've got. Mm -hmm. And it has, it always has a positive effect on everything else. Totally. And I, I can give you story after story where the culture has actually shifted because of what you're talking about. So mm -hmm. um, really, really appreciate what you're sharing here, Jamie. Now, Thanks, just yeah. as we come to a close, what's some of the work that you're doing right now that you're really excited about that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, thanks. Um, the one thing I just want to promote is that debriefing can also be debriefing around what went well and good, like just yeah. the positive. So that's safety one, safety two. Thank and you. I think that's super important because again, I heard from a recent nursing program about a few students that opted out halfway through their specialty nursing program. And when they were asked in their interviews as to why it was because they were never told that they did a good job or nobody yeah. ever asked them like, what did you do well? Or what are you proud Thank of today? You. And I think that's super important. So I just wanted to mention that before we move on. But what I am working on is actually a paper around using debriefing for clinical educators. So using the PEARLS tool. So PEARLS was developed by um, Walter Epic and Adam Chang, which is kind of one of our one of the most popular frameworks for debriefing and simulation. So it's promoting excellence and reflective learning in SIM, but we're modifying it to be promoting excellence and reflective learning in clinical. So I'm working with Juliana Harvey from um, Mount Royal. And so we're publishing a paper on using pearls for clinical educators for emotional debriefing with students or learners. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding is that educators want to debrief, but they don't actually have a tool or a resource. And I'm a right. very like, you know, I'm an emerge nurse. I like to know what I'm doing. I like to have an you know, an AL ACLS algorithm or something. I want to work through things and I want to be able to know what I'm doing. And I don't think very theoretical. So I really need to have something structured. And so utilizing mm -hmm. a bit of a cognitive aid or a resource tool on how to effectively debrief students, again, to help with their emotional digestion of what they're learning and the stress that they're mm -hmm. under as a learner and balancing, you know, home and life and cr the crazy chaos of healthcare these days. So we're developing a tool on emotional debriefing for clinical educators. So Mark Julie Leanna and I are both educators. Um, so I'm working on that, um, that I'd really like to promote. And then I'm just doing a lot of like consulting around clinical event debriefing. So I'm kind of working a bit with Vancouver Coastal Health and their Burns Trauma Unit on kind of advising with BC Children's and here with um, Interior Health and just trying to promote people to um, get interested and do some mm. education so that we can increase the culture of making it normal that we're going to debrief after events and not making mm. it just the abnormal off ones, which people might 
enter with a bit of a feeling of dread, like, oh, we're debriefing. That means we all really did terrible. And I really mm. want to change that narrative that we're just going to debrief after every code and every trauma or every event or every patient fall or every right. sort of, you know, violent outlook. code whites are a huge one to debrief for process system right. issues and emotional, you know, check-ins. So um, I just think it should become a bit more of the norm. And I think we'd have a way better cohesive, you know, collaborative, um, high-performing teams within healthcare the more we do this. So that's kind of, I guess, how Thank I'll you. say. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for your work. This yeah, is this thanks. is actually really encouraging to know oh, that you're good. out there doing this. So oh, thank you for your work. And yeah, when no can we expect that the tool will be out for seniors? Because yeah. I, I can think of about a half a dozen that are going to be mm -hmm. asking me after the show, I'm, I'm when so will I get that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, Julianne and I are meeting in August with the hope to put it forward to a couple different uh, journals. So we are really hoping um, by the fall, we'll see how that mm. goes. She has more experience with publications than I do, but we have it pretty much together. Um, we just need to get it in for some edits. So I'm really hoping soon. Unfortunately, I wish I had a time, but I don't. Well, you let me know when it comes out. <laughs> I'll will, make sure that sure. I mention it on yes, the show. I am going to be promoting everyone. <laughs> awesome. So what, how can people get in touch with you? What's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Yeah, thanks. Um, probably through LinkedIn, I guess that's how you and I found each other. I'm on yeah. there a bit more. I've kind of scaled back a bit more of my other social media accounts. Andrew and I, I used to follow Andrew Petronaska on uh, Twitter, but I'm kind of scaling back from some of those. And um, yeah, my my email, I guess, here at the university, which is jgallagher at tru.ca. So. Nice. Mm -hmm. Jamie, thank you so much for your yeah, time thanks, and Trace. for the work you're doing in the world. Thank really you. appreciate you. I appreciate you. I'm very grateful to be on here. So thanks so much. You're welcome. All right. Thank you so much for listening to the end of the podcast. And remember, you can reach out to Jamie directly on LinkedIn and also look in the show notes for some of the references that she mentioned as well. Thank you so much for listening. And remember to be a safe space. Thank you again for getting to the end of this podcast. And if you enjoyed this and you found that there was value in it for you, my invitation is for you to subscribe for future episodes that come out weekly on Tuesdays. Thank you again. And I'm looking forward to being with you next time. Now remember to be a safe space.